since everyone can enjoy some of material examples, I present to you again the great state that was built here in Atlanta. And if you can look, we have many things in here that not only represent the apparent institutions of life out there, but as always, there are these same institutions are inside of each person's intellect. Of the military, the sports facilities, medicine, the world of academia, and religion. Housing projects, office buildings, banks, <coughs> seats of government, and I think there's even a bar hidden somewhere. <laughs> and of course the city park where Kairuk says he meets many of these interesting characters. I personally think that the bar is probably closer to the park than Kairuk lets <laughs> on. <laughs> and then notice this somewhat area that I have referred to in other times and other places in a battlefield context. This is almost no man's land between the trenches back in WW1, the good war. <laughs> and then notice a gradual embankment and then up to the area that is really unpopulated vis-a-vis -vis the ordinary city institutions. Nothing's been done here. And there seems to be it's my opinion, my observation, there seems to be perhaps a hint that there may be some encampment up there, that there might be something going on up there which in relationship to the city is virgin. You can get back to me and see where I was pointing. The virgin territories, folks, yeah. is there on the model. The virgin territory is here in your model I am tempted to, if not try, I'm tempted to say, and I'll give in, that what I was going to start off talking about tonight might even lend itself to the kinds of speech for me that would be sans dramatics and profanity and cheap allusions to all sorts of things of science fiction and paperback novels and music and James Brown's obviously unfair incarceration in the state in a nearby state prison but then again if I did in such a way that would actually please the Bertrand Russells Bertie as we used to know him <laughs> I'm not sure what impact it would have, but I said all of that simply, or even less simply, to suggest to you, and I'm going to do more than suggest, that this is getting real, real close to serious stuff, because it sounds so straightforward and dry is why I said I started to go ahead and present it, just blah, 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 and just move on, or say thank you for your views and good night, <laughs> that sort of thing. So listen up. I'll give it a little spin to start with. I've had this story, and I give you the basis of it, and everyone is free. May I even encourage you to come up with a play, a story, anything. Here's the basis of it. I just never got around to doing anything with it, since I don't seem to get around to doing anything with anything in, re in regards to writing. Uh, let us say that there is this absentee owner of the universe, or at least planet Earth. And through various other possibilities and no need to go into, he hires three landlords. And he decides that there should be, for these tenants, that is man, that there should be a final day of reckoning, as some people already believe. But let us say that the great absentee owner decides there really should be, and he turns it over to these three guys, or gals, or entities, surely not Enochs, but he turns it over to them, and he says, all right, decide what will be the basis of judgment. How will people be tried? And he says, I gotta go, I got, you know, my limo's waiting, and it leaves. And so you got these three guys, I always remember three guys, of course, it's your story. I guess you can make it any number you want to, but I'm suggesting to you it's three guys. 
<laughs> and so they've got to decide what shall be the basis of us judging by the judgment of man, each man. Should it be, conclude thee, they, after a short meeting, should it be that men will be judged on the basis of what they thought, what they said, or what they did? Now, even though it was a short meeting, as I said, uh, somewhere, in the midst, somewhere in the midst of it, one of the guys even said, should we include uh, what they felt? And they all went, no, 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 no. So they didn't, they didn't include that, which I may get into in a minute. They only came up with three. And I must at least suggest to you, if you didn't get the drift of my story, that they were out of the ordinary. They're not just run-of-the-mill accountants or lawyers or you know, other ne'er-do-wells. Actually exceptional beings. And so I am suggesting to you that the possibilities they came up with about covered it, adequately covered it. But there they sat, trying to decide, shall the final judgment, the trial of each and every person, shall it be? Assuming, of course, they've got the access to immediately comprehend, realize, and then make their determination of how each and every person, each and every person will live. Will it be on the basis of what that person thought? Shall that be the factor? Will it be on the basis of what they said for their lifetime? on the basis of what they did. Think about it a second. We'll have this little part of the drama. I'll go. Did you think about it? Generally speaking, people are not inherently wired up they are not concerned over what they say or what they think when it comes to the matter of I wish I could change which is inherent in everyone that I need to change they are not natively wired up to be at all concerned really with what they think what they say but only how they behave now, I will jump out in front of your own ordinary consciousness and point this out. That mankind does, oftentimes, speak about the need to change the way they think, their speech. But all they do is talk about it. <laughs> And the only reason they're concerned about it, the only reason that life even makes them apparently concerned about it, is only in regards to how it is connected to behavior. Think about this. I got another second. I got another sip. Think about it. It's the kind of thing you'd never thought about before. But if I had given you a direct question after my opening gambit of giving you that story, I didn't actually have such a story like that. I made it up. Figure that out. <laughs> that almost made me dizzy. <laughs> if I had if I had said, look, there are three ways that men could be judged. That we could judge not just in an afterlife at the final reckoning day, but each person, if we were going to look at people and try to be a living critic of humanity. All the way from that to an after-death judgment day. And if I said, all right, there's obviously three bases, and that is, or three possibilities. Judge each person on what they said, or judge each person on what they thought, or on what they did. And if I had said, all right, everybody, write down. Which one do you think? It's not a trick question or anything. If I just said, which one do you think? Which one do you believe? Which one do you feel would be the proper one? I suggest that we would get a cross-section that one of those possibilities would get a vote. And if I took a little further and I said, well, now how about during one person's lifetime? You've got your own person at the very least to use as an example. All you've got to do is consider yourself. But do you think that most people are concerned? 
since everybody has some desire to change, everybody has the itch to do something different, that they should be a different person. And if I ask you, do you believe that most people are more concerned about changing how they think, how they talk, or how they behave? I suggest again that all three of those would get a number of votes. Because it seems obvious, even if you thought, well, I probably worry more about the first one than the other two, or the second one than the other two. But then you'd, I'm playing your part, I suggest to you that you would think for a second, trying to be sincere, and you'd think, well, but everybody's not like me, and I hear a lot of people talk. Some people are really concerned. They even try to take courses to improve the way they speak. I hear people say that they try to practice some sort of intellectual discipline to uh, control, to bring under some kind of direct their will, how their brain operates. And so you would think, all right, all three must have some adherence. Think about it, since I've said otherwise. Generally speaking, humans are not wired up to be really concerned vis-a-vis -vis change, but not to be concerned over how they think, what they say, only how they behave. And the first two, they talk about, they write about, they claim off and on that they are concerned about. There's no doubt about that. But it's only insofar as it's connected with how they behave. Anybody can hear that. It's so crude that it may be missing some of you, but anybody can hear that, then I ask you, how can it be that no one recognizes that? That men, intellectually sophisticated men back in the city, would say that there are people who attempt, who are concerned, even if they do not make any great successful style, that changing, but there are people who are truthfully undoubtedly concerned about changing the way they think. They want to change the way they think. Whether they succeed or not, they want to. They work on it. And that there are people who want to change the way they talk. And if they don't really succeed, they work on it. And it's not true. You got you. Every time you think about change. <laughs> now life is wired up in such a way that even though people are generally only wired up to be concerned about how they behave, There is this kind of knowledge that, again, you might say seeps through into some areas of ordinary consciousness through a crude osmosis that men here and there will admit that, all right, even though I may be willing to change my behavior, it in some way has got to be connected with the way I think, such as somebody wants to lose weight. Let's say. You do understand out of those three possibilities, that is a change in behavior. It's not just a change in the amount of average for body fat, it's a change in behavior. And so there are people around. I know this. I'm not absolutely dumb, and oblivious to city life. There are even courses, there are books, there are people who come on TV and say, take our course, money back guarantee, blah, 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 to lose weight. And one of the areas is that nowadays psychology and blah 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 we all understand that you've got to change your lifestyle blah 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 that is we're going to have to change the way that you think about eating the way you think about yourself <laughs> they say that and it even sounds today that this may be a more sophisticated a more comprehensive a more up-to-date diet plan but does anybody who wants to lose weight Give a rat's ass. <laughs> now, I saw I wouldn't curse, but that's technical. That's medical jargon. No one who wants to lose weight gives a royal rat's ass about how they think. But at that moment, if they're sitting there, and there's one of these 30-minute commercials passing off as a program nowadays, you know, a talk program, and there's person after person saying, I lost weight, I lost weight on this plan, I didn't think it was possible, but I lost weight, I've tried everything, and you're sitting there, if you want to lose weight, and you're going, well, wait a minute, and you start writing down the address, and you can see the price they ask, and you think about that. And then they start this stuff about, now the pills and the stuff we got, it's going to be absolutely uh, effortless on your part to lose weight. But they got to kill the rest of the 30 minutes, and they bring on a guy who, they put a PhD behind his name. And so you assume he's a psychologist, you don't know that it came from a mail order house out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> but at any rate, he says, uh, losing weight, 
is a not just an instant job because you did not get fat instantly. It may take you at least two weeks on this great plan. <laughs> and I even have contributed, and it's not just that you are weak or that you're dumb because you're fat. Probably some of it, much of it, is subconscious because of your childhood, and you're having fat thoughts. You're having thoughts that tend to make you obese. And nowadays, people, pretty ordinary people, they don't have to be college educated in the city, will listen to that, and it's, it's an added inducement. It helps the sales pitch, even if they never think about such things. It sounds correct nowadays that we're going to... There are cassettes that come along with the magic pills and stuff that you can play. You don't have to really listen to it. You can just put it on. Put it on at night when you're asleep. And it subliminally will work. And what it's going to do is change this kind of fat pattern thinking that you have, which is really the culprit because you're not weak, are you? The people sitting in front of the TV with, you know, <laughs> chips and dip, they're going, no. They say, you don't want to be fat. And they go, no, no, no. Something is making you fat, like little fat unconscious thought demons. They go, yeah. <laughs> Uh, they say the course, the book, the cassettes will help. <laughs> Do see this quite simply. Nobody cares about the way they think. They can sit there at the moment and believe they do. They can believe that, all right, there is some connection. That man with a PhD said there is, and yeah, it sounds right. They don't know why, but it sounds right. And they say, among the other things, the pills and our secret ingredient, our secret formula that you're going to get for 1995 will make you lose weight just like that. But on top of that, the cassettes and our book that read that, and it will help change the way that you think because you have fallen into or you're unconsciously driven into thinking fat. And people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't care. Nobody cares generally about changing. They're not concerned about changing the way they think or the way they speak. Now, I know this. It's not, obviously, to me, it's not the boom business that diet plans are, but I hear on radio nowadays or TV, these pitches will come on for a cassette or a course, they'll say, people judge you by the way you speak. Successful people speak successfully. Intelligent people speak intelligently. Take this course. You don't really have to listen to it good. Put it on a cassette when you're driving or whistling or asleep. <laughs> but it'll improve your vocabulary and the way you speak. I know all that. But do you understand? And that's a pretty crude example, but it's one that obviously you people should be able to follow. No offense to you people. Don't you people write me. If you're a you people, don't write me. <laughs> do you understand the people who would be involved with this, that even find it of any interest and might pursue it, they do not care how they speak. It's how they behave. The full gamut that even the ad that I was repeating more or less is purveying, if not directly, at least everyone involved, the advertiser and those who might listen, understand what it's saying is, if you spoke a different way, if you change the way you speak, then you're going to behave differently. People are going to perceive you as behaving differently. People who ordinarily wouldn't give you the time of day at a party, once they hear you speak, will come up and say, buy this stock tomorrow and you'll be rich by Friday. Don't tell anybody. Love the way you speak. And haven't you lost weight? <laughs> I repeat again, do not miss this because this is real right up in your face. This has to do with the way life is wired up, the human intellect. That old intelligence believes that the way people operate, the way that they even judge each other, the way that they try themselves, and by extension into the myths and the religions of these kind of institutions, the magnifications are the reductions according to which end you're looking from, of men believing that the gods will eventually judge us individually. You're going to stand there and on some basis it's going to say, all right, here's what we know about you. Everything is wired up in old intelligence to believe this is a very complex situation to such a degree that if we had started with my kind of questions to the public in general, and I said, what is the real basis of judging people, either after death or now? And if I'd sort of pried them along, I'd said, the possibility seemed to me that you could judge a man by the way he thinks, if we knew what it was, or the way he speaks, or the way he acts, his actual behavior. And I suggest to you that everybody on this planet, more or less, generally speaking, would say, yeah, you're right. 
If I said probably some people it's more one than the other, and they'd say, yeah, you're probably right. Some people it seems to be more a matter of how they behave, and they say, yeah, you're right. But they would agree that, well, I, there are those kinds of possibilities, those kinds of classifications that are reasonable. Thus, they would think it is a combination of these kinds of factors that a man does think, a man does speak, a man does behave. And of course, there would be those that would finally say, you left out feeling. So they could make it four. But it's at least three, and they would say, this is very complex, when the thing is, it's very simplistic. And it passes for complex with old intelligence. That's why I said you may miss it, it's so up front. People are not wired up in any manner, generally speaking. We're not talking about one or two people out here on the fringes of life churning up everybody's account, and almost anything can happen here and there. Here and there, somebody, if they tried to churn the guy's account, they figured he was El Stupido, and he lived out in the sticks, and they didn't hear from him, but every five years, even checking on his account, that they can churn his account until they just clean it out. <laughs> that they just keep trading until the broker's commission even eats up everything. But even out here on the fringes, the point is, accidentally, here and there, one guy will make a lot of money while they're trying to break him. But remember, that don't count. The fringe of life does not count. Unless you're there, of course. <laughs> and then what you should be counting is see if you've got enough money to get on a bus and get back in town, get back, get back in the middle class. Get back in the fat part of the bell curve. The ordinary people, life, generally speaking, but they're all the ordinary, life is not wired up men to be concerned about how they think, about what they think, to be concerned that they think bad things. Now, I know again that they will say they do. Not just a matter of losing weight and not just in the, any other example I can make up that it would seem to be perhaps a little more commercial, but people believe it does if they hear or read and something jogs their memory about psychiatry, psychology, analysis, and how it helps people. And some psychiatrist sitting on a talk show and says something about, well, of course, we are simply the product of what we think. And the interviewer will go, my, my, how weighty. And perhaps you want to say, boy, I want to write that down because I know it's true and I keep forgetting that. The reason you keep forgetting it is because people keep forgetting it. People are not wired up to think that, to be concerned about that. They hear it, and nowadays, in the bell part of the curve of life, on most of this planet now at least, when people hear, well, what we are, our behavior, the way in which we live, is really just a product of how we think. People go, my, my, how true, how true. But as far as operationally in ordinary people, it is not how true, how true. They go, yeah, in the same way that they can apparently talk about the need. They don't have to just have their memory jogged by someone else talking about thoughts influencing, if not dictating, the way one lives, sometimes they'll think it themselves. That, well, the way I behave, the way I do these things that I don't like, that I should change these patterns or this habit. I need to change my thinking about it also. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I should write that down. What a guy I am. Mm, you know, to think that. And they immediately forget it because the concern is not how they think. It is a connection about how they behave. Now I ask you, twee, to what end is life wired up, man, in such a way that he does not see this? That at least, let me just be crude, that at least one-third of humanity that heard my question would say, well, the most important thing about a man is what he thinks. That's how we should judge a man. That's how I judge myself. That is how probably the gods are going to judge us. Because what else are we other than what we think? We're not animals. We're thinking creatures, or we're supposed to be, those of us who are decent. That we are thinkers. Another third of humanity will go, well, people can think all sorts of things. In fact, your life, things that you had no control over, your environment, your childhood, makes you think certain ways. I, I've had, I don't want to talk about them, but I've had horrible thoughts about my own family. But I didn't make myself do it. It's the way they treated me. 
So the gods can't, you know, that's the most important thing. And even if the gods can't hold us responsible, the most important thing, the thing we've got to work on, the thing that needs to be changed, is not just what we say, but it's what we think. Or it's not what we think, it's what we say, that I can't be responsible. In this example, don't let me confuse you, I ran it backwards there for a second. The example I was doing just then is the person says, I cannot necessarily be responsible for what I think because unconscious childhood traumas and etc. make me think real naughty things at times. But I don't have to say it. I don't have to tell my mother or father that, boy, you really mistreated me back when I was younger and you were drinking a lot. And a lot of times, I don't know, three or four times a month, I probably wish you were dead. I don't have to say that. We don't have to tell people unsociable, insulting truths. That's what manners are about. That's what being civilized is about. Another third of the people in the world would say, what the hell difference does it make what you say or what you think? Because all of us, we kill each other, we strangle each other, uh, we look at other people's wives and husbands and you know, wish we had them in the sack. And people say things. People have a few drinks and they say, how you toots, how you doing? Or they say, get my way, you fat ass. I'll... We say those things, but... The only thing that matters is how we behave. That's all that counts. You would have that, I suggest, as a fair division in humanities. Perception of my question. And I go back and tell you again, generally speaking, people are not wired up to be concerned over how they think or how they speak. It's only how they behave. They didn't decide it. Life didn't make you do that. I mean, your individual life, your environment. Life. And nobody ever thinks about that. And if they thought about it, nobody can ever see it directly. And if they saw it for a second, they'd go, well, so? Give yourself a break. Maybe I should try and force you to look at it a little more personally. Look at all the things that you apparently think about changing. All the naughty habits, all the bad thoughts, all of the bad things you say, all the bad things you have done, all the bad things that you fear you might do, that you fear you might say. Look at what a complex melange you seem to have. But now if you take what I have pointed out for at least five or six times already, that people, including you, are not wired up generally to be concerned at all over what they think or what they say, it's over their behavior. If you can get a glimpse of that and then begin to get a good steady view of that, do you see that insofar as you still are wrestling around at times back in the city, how that would simplify the wrestling around? <laughs> that at least you don't have to thrash about <laughs> in thrice directions. <laughs> There's only one direction that people are thrashing in. They're hollering about two, three, some of them four, but they all thrash in one way, the way they behave. Do you think that this might, if life deals and such, have any subliminal message that a man or a woman here and there might go, hark, now that I see and hear that, the people are really only concerned about the way they behave, what might that be telling me about life's concern about us? I don't know. I'll have to think about that. In fact, I'll go talk to somebody, a friend of mine, about that. If you were one of the three landlords of my store, one of the three people in charge of setting up Judgment Day, or reestablishing it, no, oh, never mind. I was, was going to say, for some of you who used to be religious, but you know, the hell you used being religious, if they were actually going to establish a Judgment Day, would those three possibilities suffice? Would that adequately cover man for him to either be judged in the way he thinks, speaks, or behaves? Or would any of you insist as one of those three guys did in the first part of the meeting say, so we got to include feeling. It should be, is a man going to be judged on what he said, or what he thought? I can go with that. How you behaved? Okay. But we got to add, or what he felt. Doesn't that sound like that I have spent, what, 20 minutes 
and just really left out one that do we need to just perhaps if I can do it fast enough mm-hmm. we can just stop the tape and erase it and right back and start all over and I you know, say all right there are three possible four possibilities that I meant to say shouldn't I I made a mistake I forgot about it I just realized it not hardly <laughs> and even if that was true I wouldn't admit it would I <coughs> where does so called feeling come in does anyone remember I was apparently talking about something obviously not on this subject because it was many 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 moons ago and I pointed out to you that uh all the little Ken and Barbie dolls and almost everything else that's made. I was using an example though of injected plastic molding. But I can, if you could follow it, I could use everything from trees to iron ore. But take good little Ken and Barbie dolls and look at that as being a representation of you and you and you. And that everywhere on there, such objects, when you look on all of them, you'll find that little circle where they got injected, that is where they were made. Or as people in Alabama used to say, that's why you had a navel. They'd tell their children, that's where God went, ding, and made you. They did, and that's before plastics even. <laughs> but they had that story, but you look on Ken and Barbie, and somewhere there's that little thing, or a little plastic gun. That is where the mold injected, or when the uh, machinery injected, the plastic made the mold, and then they had to cut it off. It's like your navel being tied up, tied off. So, there is an entry point. Now, what in the world does that have to do with the question that I just presented? <laughs> God, not only do I not know, I can't even remember what the question was. <laughs> it's just a joke. Don't write me. I can remember the question. Don't write me. <laughs> what does that have to do with the possibility? In fact, the fairly sound sounding possibility that we should include feeling along with the possibilities insofar as judging determining, even describing adequately man of his thoughts, his speech, his behavior, and his feeling. (laughs) It sounds right almost, doesn't it? In fact, you people who are getting good, if I'd started off, if I stopped right now and said, all right, let's cut the tape, I can't can't really (laughs) fake this, I meant to say feeling, and I started this whole thing over and did feeling, do you realize that all of you would go along? not because you're necessarily stupid but it's so close to city reality I could throw it right in and say well I should have done that I I was going to do it another way but uh, it's just too confusing so let's go back and there's really four possibilities I'm going to talk about four people and they're, they're trying to decide because that's the only full way to cover the possibilities of meaningful descriptions of man or how man could be judged was on either how he thinks, speaks, behaves, or how he felt. Now, we just got included. So I could say all over, and do you, you got to know that much by you by now. And that, that's not an attack on you that you go right along because it sounds right. It makes sense. And it seems like, well, yeah, you can't leave that out. Think about that spot. Think about your navel. Think about what fuels everything else. Yeah, but my intellect fuels itself. (laughs) My behavior, well, of course, certain parts of it. One half of my nervous system, at least, is not really under conscious control. Can't be. Even certain of my habits and gestures work so fast that I can't stop and try and take care of them. But still, my behavior... In general, that is, whether I go out and kill people, whether I hold up people, whether I'm walking down the street and just turn to a stranger and go, ah, and kill them and strangle them. Now that's under, my, my behavior is what, how I behave. Really? Yes. I could do a variation of one of those good old... Alabama threw away curses, and even Kairou gave his version once. But I could say, who died and left you in charge of you? <laughs> and of course, ordinary people would go, all right.
Can anybody see? I don't just simply come out and say what I had to say and leave it there. Can you see everything that I just proposed that you that would have happened had I included feeling? Or if I stop now? Which I, how about this? If I'm not getting too muddy with you, I even as I was standing here five minutes ago considered starting out and saying, what if I had said that I should have included feeling and I'd done a few minutes of that and went, well, wait a minute. Do cut the tape in the same because I'm just faking it now. I, let's start all over because I want to include feeling to make this clear. That I, I was about to fool you and say, well, I could have done that, but I need to go ahead and do it. How many of you can sit there now? You've got to be able to use your intellect in that way or you are absolutely an antique lover. That is, you're going to end up with old intelligence till you die. To realize that I could have done that or not done it, or I could have said that I was going to do it and not do it, or I could have said I was going to do it for this and that reason, and then said, nah, never mind. And then a few more minutes say, well, no, nah, I can't fake it. Let's do go back and do it. I could have put it in, left it out, but in either case, not because I'm such a great speaker and not because you're dumb, but feeling fits it. If I say it does it, once I describe it, not just because I said it, because all I'm doing, this whole thing is a satire. No, scrap. <laughs> cut, cut satire. Be sure and cut that out of the film. This whole thing is a, uh, a metaphor for human life. Whew, well, that was a close. <laughs> but for it to be a decent metaphor, our satire, you do understand it has to be very close to the truth. You can't have a parody about baseball if it's got no relationship to anything involved with the sport, with the whole scenario. There has to be a kind of parallel. Everybody surely knows you can see that. So it has nothing to do, ultimately, with your level of ordinary intelligence or my great ability as a persuasive speaker. It is simply that it's so close to the reality of the city that if I said there are three ways that, to judge people, that even the gods themselves, the way they've made us, the way they did it, they've got to play with their own game. If they're going to have a final judgment day, other than you know, if they're just going to be dogmatic and just everybody stands up, that the head guy or whoever it is, a panel looks at you and goes, ah, you know, nah. next guy, you know, hey, she ain't bad. All right, you can stay. If it wasn't that, and they're going to have some reasonable basis, what would it be? And I suggest, all right, it's got to be they've got to decide, either individually on these classifications or maybe some combination, but at least individually, they could do it this way. They made us. They know that we are creatures that think, that speak, and we behave. And so they've got to decide on the basis of one of those. And you would have gone, yeah? And I could have said, no, no, wait a minute. All right, it's got to be this. It's got to be, since they made us and we know I'm pointing out the obvious. I didn't make this up. I just put the classification. It's got to be either them deciding on the basis of how we think, how we speak, how we behave, or how we feel. Either one of them, both of them sound just right. Am I right? There is a kind of dastardly, <laughs> pleasant, new intellectual dance that you ought to be able to do that I could stop for the night. And you should just find that. Not because I put it that way, but you should find it interesting that Jesus, that's true. He could have done that to me, and I went, yeah, 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 yeah. Or he could have said, no, wait a minute. Cut the tape. It's these four. And he could have done that, and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And seeing one of them does not make the other one incorrect. If you're at ordinary level of intelligence, that's all you had. Once I added feeling, then you would have said, well, all right, the first one of just the three... It wasn't that the, any of the three were incorrect. It was just that they were uh, uh, flawed. Yeah. Lacking. Yeah. But you didn't know it until I pointed it out. How can both of them seem to be all right? How can both of them seem to be inclusive, indicative, emblematic? If you can be emblematic literally, which I just said you could, but I'm tired of having to arm wrestle Webster and his whole crew. We got to turn the audio over. Can I hold them? Yeah, go back and. <coughs> Could I have them? I'll stall if you'll hurry.
Does anybody wonder what's beyond? The uncharted? The... <laughs> the home of present revolutionary activity, if there are any, is any, what would be beyond that? Well, the stage and the floor, for one thing. For those of you that think that the idea of infinity is passe, of course, any of you who do, I hate to tell you, but you wouldn't be you don't want to hear what infinity has to say about you. <laughs> Are we back rolling? All right. Just slightly connected to that. Just ever so tenuously. There's another. little thing that continually occurs in life and the song goes like this. There are three parties involved in this little scenario. You, another person that you are in the, in whose presence you are in, and a third party, not present. And the other, the party that you're with says, and it's in defense of this third party that you don't really know. This person says, I want you to understand, let's call it a he, that he is not really like that letter he wrote you. Let's put it that way. <laughs> And let us say that this person has some knowledge. Maybe you showed them a letter that somebody else wrote you. That somebody made a phone call, but right sounds easier. Let's stick with this example. You'll see where it's going in a second. And you even showed this person. You said, well, I got a letter. Don't you know so-and-so? And they say, yeah. And say, read that. Maybe they read it. And they say, I guess you're upset at that. Or if they say, well, so? And you say, well, my opinion. Or this person wants to do some kind of business with me or something. And you say, uh, my answer is No. And I'll tell you on the basis of blah, blah, blah. And the person, this person that you're with, looks at it and reads it and says, all right, I can't blame you necessarily for saying that. And I see some of the basis of you reacting that way. But aren't we friends? We're not level with you. And you go, all right, all right. And say, truthfully, I want to tell you, now I've known him many years. You know, I thought you did. But I'll tell you, he is really nothing like this letter. Believe me. All right, now think about it. What the person is saying, for those of you that need to be reminded, you and your people, all this sounds as though we're talking about human beings, psychological occurrences, and it's all about biochemistry. It's all about physics. Except it gets real boring to most of you if I just talk in equations and theorems and principles and laws. So it sounds like that a strange presentation that normally goes unnoticed has taken place because this person here defending the third party is saying this. They're saying that he is not at all like his behavior. <laughs> Think about it. They're not saying he's not at all like his speech. Let's take the letter as being a form of speech. They're not saying that. And they're not saying, well, he's not at all like he thinks. Because we could say, like the letter, assuming it was not a sh charade of some kind, that the letter in some way represents how he thinks. Because a person can only say and write what they think, correct? Darn right. So what they're saying is, wait a minute. I, I read the letter and I know what I, I can see how it might have struck you but believe me he is nothing like his behavior but if it if they say well he's nothing like this letter people will go well uh, how can a person be separate from their behavior how can there be a difference between a he 
and his behavior. Now before I say, and I wasn't prepared to right then, before I say, well, there can't be any difference, leave it at a question for a second. How can there be a difference? What would it be? How are you going to think about it? Much less describe it. That, all right, there's he, this guy we're talking about, this third party that wrote you this letter. There's this he, and this other person knows the he. You don't know him. You got this letter. You may have heard a few comments, but you got this letter. And this other person is not only defending, but he's attempting to give, it appears, a reasonable, even an objective, description. But what they're saying is that there is a difference between what he is and how he behaves. Think about it a second. Now, if I hadn't pointed this out, you'd let that go. The whole city, the combined intelligence of the city, they'd just go right through them. They'd be waiting for, to hear my comment. Or if I said, well, you tell me, people would come up with a comment. So what's the difference between what somebody is and how they behave? And they'd wait to hear it if they heard this from a lecturer or somewhere. And if the lecturer said, well, no, I'm serious. I want to know. What do you think? Somebody tell me, write it down. Then you'd think, well, if this was over intelligence, you'd think, well, all right, a person at times, they could be upset. Uh, uh, they could have had a, a serious injury or a death in their family. They could be sick. And so uh, somebody could behave at any given time in a way that is not truly indicative of what they are. All right, who's it indicative of? <laughs> their evil twin brother? <laughs> it would just roll, go right through intelligence, like X likes through a duck, I guess. <laughs> not that ducks need it, actually. <laughs> Old intelligence has no grasp upon this. It is like greased Velcro. <laughs> it, I could ask old intelligence, what kind of difference is there possibly? What are you thinking of when you nod if I say, all right, in this scenario, this scene I'm up, that a man says that he's not at all like this letter. And then I say, what that is saying is that he is not like he behaves. And old intelligence go, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I say, all right, what is the difference? And then if I insisted, it would go into those kind of examples or it didn't feel good or a person sometimes can do something that they later regretted, and et cetera. But don't let it slip by you. That ordinary intelligence will go ahead and take it as being a given. That there is a difference between what a person is, whatever the hell they mean by that, and how he behaves. What difference is there between whoever this guy was, the author of the letter, and the letter? Now I'll repeat one more time for, I'll stand in for old intelligence. Old intelligence say, well, there could be all the difference in the world. And now i got to talk for you, at least potentially, new intelligence. What difference? Where are you going to get even a sliver of paper? Where are you going to get is those physicists and engineers in the crowd remember, where are you going to get even a CH? Where are, you going to, where are you going to slide it between what a man is and his behavior? <laughs> then, as always, I could ask you, what could possibly be the operational purpose? Twee. <coughs> to what end do people everywhere Everywhere, if I present this, and it's not a arcane to put it in the way in which I have, if you ask anybody, all the way from bricklayers to atomic scientists, that is there a difference between what a person, just any person, between what they are and their behavior as such? I guess atomic scientists would like that little touch, as such. <laughs> the bricklayer would probably like per se, <laughs> or perhaps per se. <laughs> they would take that as being a reasonable question they wouldn't analyze it they wouldn't think well this is a trick to what end is life wired up men that they take that as being a given they take that as being a fair verbal representation of reality that they would insist if I really pushed it with ordinary consciousness, ordinary intelligence in the city, uh, they would really begin to dig in. If I said, if I, 
that no longer fooling around. No more insinuations. I am telling you there's no difference between what a man is and his behavior. Then would have people began to really entrench themselves and say, well, that was an interesting philosophical notion. It was a rhetorical question of the sort that I could entertain for a short period. But if you're going to tell me that you actually believe that there's no difference, wait a minute. If you'll be objective for a second, I'll show you the error of your ways. And they would then begin to do so, assuming that they were fairly glib. <laughs> what is the difference? What possible difference? Where are you going to get your finger in? Where are you going to get a thought in? Where are you going to get your tongue in between those two and say, wait a minute, we'll pry this apart a little bit more and I'll show you the difference. Why does life make people believe that there is such a difference? That a man is not simply the way he behaves. Sometimes he could be, but then at other times he obviously is not, as witnessed by this letter. I know the guy. This is not him. How much further do I have to go? All right, who is it? Who wrote it for him? His evil twin brain, right? No, his, e his evil twin hand, the hell of a pen. All right, how about this? His evil twin behavior. <laughs> except for this, you can't behave except one way at a time. <laughs> so how can you tell us the evil twin? Because he can tell you it was. Well, all right. Well, <laughs> now I understand. That's like me, you know, I almost caught myself not before last when I was pointing out that people have changed very little. But I almost talked myself into it. To say the guy that you meet after these years, and he's cut his hair, <coughs> taken a bath, got a suit and tie, and tells you that he's stopped all dope, faithful to his wife, feeds his children, pays his taxes, attends some church, he tells you that. Is that not a drastic change with that guy that you used to know? <laughs> Jesus, yes. <laughs> because he told you that. It's amazing. <laughs> he even looks a little different. <laughs> well, I've, I've never seen him with a tie before, and you had this old stringy beard for years, but he looks different. But on top of that, did you hear? He said that he has stopped all dope. He said he's faithful to his wife. He said, totally. He said, no fooling around. It's just, he, he just said that it's a serious matter with him, fidelity to his family. <laughs> Is that change or what? I know I'm impressed. So you can ask a man, are you your behavior? Well, what do you mean? Well, for instance, this letter. Oh, you didn't care for that much, did you? Well, I'm asking, is, is this really represent, representative of you? Uh, no, no, no. No, no, as soon as I sent that thing, I ran to the post office. I was trying to get it back. But there's a long story I can't tell you. They won't let you take your letter back. And, uh, well, i tell you what, it was a mistake because I'd heard that you were looking for somebody to do so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, I don't know, I got confused. I was thinking about this other job application. Uh, really, I hope you didn't take it personally because I think so highly of you and I've wanted to meet you and blah, blah, blah. So you can think, all right, has this guy changed? Remember the guy that a few minutes ago? <laughs> Just got a shave, a suit, and he told you that he has given up all forms of dope, infidelity to his wife, mistreatment of his children, avoidance of taxes. What a change. So this guy says, all right, I can see you don't like the letter, and I can't tell you I blame you. But uh, that letter is not the real me. <coughs> to what end is life wired up? Does anybody remember the question I left as kind of an excursion? several meetings back when I said, what if this partnership arrangement, the feeling that everyone has in their own intelligence, or is it old intelligence sometimes wants to call in its consciousness that there are two obvious speaking, moving, listening aspects of intelligence. What if this was wired up and put in man in such a way that one of them was responsible for blanking and the other one was in charge of blanking? 
I just thought I'd go ahead and say it since I saw so many of you obviously trying to make such a connection between that and what I'm talking about now. <laughs> Don't write and tell me that I'm being sarcastic. I prefer to think of it as being subtly encouraging. Or as some Mississippi philosophers used to say, if the sarcasm fits, <laughs> take it on home with you. <laughs> Try it on, go ahead and wear it. It, it fits real good. It looks, looks real good on you, son. I do not personally abide by such philosophy, but I just... I felt under the fairness doctrine that I should give some, if not equal time, a passing acknowledgement that there have been people in Mississippi that could actually speak. Don't write me, all right? How much time we got? Okay. How about this, then? By now, can everybody see, when I talk in a certain way, a connection... such as this, that I can refer to things as, and this is related to them being goods, these are V, if we were talking about verbs and services. And you remember what I pointed out some time back, these great dual classifications and divisions of acting external goods and services. You're in the plumbing business, plumbing supplies, plumbing services. That's it. You can buy a toilet, plus you can say, my toilet's broke, we'll fix it. You can buy a toilet and say, right, how am I going to do with it? All right, for an extra money, we install it. Goods and services. Nouns and verbs. I want to point out to you that man is wired up in such a way. Still, in the city, back at the level of old intelligence, that it wants to, and I'm using that, of course, in a kind of psychological, soft term, wants to. It is wired up to, but it wants to see everything as being nouns, as being goods, for a splendid reason, if you're as lazy as I am, because it requires less effort. It requires less effort here, which is one thing, but it also requires less physical effort. Why, you ask? Well, ask me why I say that first, and then we'll get into why. Part of man's responsibility from a certain view, man's job here in life's Arbitrar Q can be seen in this way that it's up to him to animate that which is apparently inanimate. Put another way, it is up to man to turn goods into services. Put another way, it is up to man to turn nouns into verbs. If that doesn't get it, now are you ready? It was only 48 hours ago that I was pointing out to you that nothing can have its full value and potential realized in its site of origin. It's up to man to move it. That's why, for ordinary intelligence, to try and perceive of everything as being goods and nouns, if we could make that fly, you wouldn't have to move the bastards. But look at it. Now look at it. Very simply. Without man, there is no way that iron ore will turn into an engine. You can sit around, you can think about it, you can talk about it. Those two. You can feel about it if you want to throw that in. That you and all sorts of your combinations can sit around iron ore and look at it. 
You can try and project. You can try and pull all kinds of metaphysical flim-flam. You can chant to it. You can sing to it. You can hold up pictures of internal combustion engines in front of it. You can try to hypnotize it. You can pray to it. But without man behaving, without man making that iron ore move from that spot, somewhere else, it may only be a few feet away. If there's iron ore out there on the surface outside of Cleveland or Pittsburgh, if they were still in business, there may be a foundry, a smelting pot, only a few feet away. But for that thing to move from the point of being goods, it's got to be serviced. And there's only one creature outside the strictly material food chain on this planet that can make goods become more valuable, that can apparently institute energy exchanges that would not be possible in any way left to the hands of all other creatures on this planet, individual and collectively. There is no way that accidentally the finest, most upstanding band of orangutans, chimpanzees, will ever get together and fuck around with some iron ore in some way, regardless of that old story about them and typewriters and finally typing out accidentally. The law of average is making them type out all of Shakespeare's work. They will never in some way turn iron ore into an engine. Never. It will lay there as goods as opposed to services. And it will lay there as goods with its value, with its potential, never realized. Because nothing is ever fully realized. Its potential is never completely exercised if it does not move from its original spot. Men, art, food, materials, minerals, ideas. Things remain at the 3D level inanimate. Iron ore lays there. Now I know that an internal combustion engine is still inanimate. But you have got to see that it has served a purpose. I just picked one of almost a, a multitude of possible examples. You can fill in your own. Man would not be where he is, regardless of what you think of insurance rates, regardless of what your personal opinion about the quality of automobiles or anything. You simply have got to see that life itself would not be what it is without the internal combustion engine. Period. You would not even be living as long as you're living. Forget about things about pollution and smog and highway deaths. You individual would not be living as long as you're living now. You would not be as healthy as you are. Even if you're living in Los Angeles or New York and there seems to be smog threatening your respiratory system. You wouldn't be old enough right now. You wouldn't be 40 years old worried about the smog. You'd have been dead at the age of 22 under certain conditions at certain times had it not been for the internal combustion engine. The internal combustion engine would not have become a kind of service. It would not become a moving verb, not part of processes, whereas a piece of ore laying on the ground is not were it not for man. Part of man's job is to, and I'll put it to you two ways for a particular reason. The part of man's job could be described as being in charge of taking goods. Consider goods, everything is just laying there. And I don't mean as dead necessarily as ore, but corn, naturally growing somewhere. That you take what is there, and right then it's goods. And it's part of man's job to animate it. Now, corn is alive from a 3D view as opposed to iron ore, but it is still not alive. It is not as much an energy exchange out there growing as it is if you pick it and you go and trade it or sell it to some other people that do not have corn or need food down the street, up on the next cliff. You can even turn it into gas a hall. Part of man's job is to think things that are just simply there and to make them more atomic, if you want to be a little more complex. But another way of looking at this, that I told you I this for a reason, I gave you another description, it is to take goods, turn them into services, and another way to consider it is to more fully realize the potential of anything. Corn, iron ore, you sit there and you whittle out a little figure, a little piece of art of your own. 
to increase the potential value, the use of it, is up to man to move it. The corn is not going to get up and walk to the next caves. The iron ore is not suddenly going to get up and begin to roll and roll over down the road somewhere to another tribe and roll up somebody's feet and make them go, ah! That's what we've been needing to do that V8 engine that old Huber was talking about. Iron ore. The figure, the little stick figure, the little totem, the little mask that you made. Yours, your own little piece of art. You're not going to lay it down and when nobody's looking, the thing get up and run off somewhere else to another tribe and them go, wow, what a cute little thing. Man, I didn't do all that just to point out the obvious. Because ordinary intelligence does not perceive this. Nothing has any real lasting value. Its potential has not begun to be exploited until it is moved. I don't care where it started. That the people could have been starving, this one little tribe, this one family, and they just walked around a corner one day, and there's corn. And they fell up on corn. They prayed. They blessed corn. They began to name their children corn. They called each other corn. <laughs> they tried to take corn and took out diamonds out of their rings and put in corn. That's only going to last until they get full, two or three hours, and then it's, boy, that stuff was great. Somebody say, you remember those guys that we traded some uh, rocks to last year up in that other cave? You remember how thin they were? Boy, imagine what they'd give for this. And everybody goes, hey. Uh. It has got to be literally moved, and there's nobody on this planet to move it outside the quite basic food chain. Now, I know that happens at other levels. But nobody is going to move things and make them more animate, make them more complex except man. But ordinary intelligence wants to see it, is wired up to see it otherwise. It wants to see everything as being nouns. It wants to see, all right, or is or. And it wants to say, well, wait a minute, don't keep trying to drag that into internal combustion engine. That's too tenuous a connection. It's too far reaching because an internal combustion engine is still a noun. Look it up in the dictionary. I don't have to look it up. I know that, I think. <laughs> Intelligence is wired up to want to look at everything as being nouns. Now, if we take this, or if I can try and drag you a little beyond what appears to be these kind of very material examples, how about in a world that would appear to be a little more linguistic? Let me put it to you this way. Ordinary intelligence, old intelligence, wants to see... <coughs> Everything as being good, solid nouns, at the very worst, temporary verbs. Now, I know that. Temporary verbs. But they're always temporary because they can be changed. They will shortly go back to being nouns. Think about it a second before I give you the punchline of what I was going to say, that old intelligence is wired up to want to see. You can't help it. It wants to see everything as being nouns. Think about it another second, then. Well, we can't last, wait here forever. <laughs> if you can see it, you can see what I mean. That it is a valid statement. But insofar as old intelligence is wired up to want to see everything as being nouns or at worst, temporary verbs, it is only what I refer to as revolutionary new intelligence it is only to that kind of intelligence that life makes complete coherent sentences <laughs> all right i'll have to jump back to good old city historic views look people believe that they're unanswerable questions they're things that we just can't understand i'm telling you another way to look at why it's because on the basis of old intelligence wanting to see, insisting to see, that everything is nouns. Or at least, all right, temporary verbs, but just a second, they'll be back. Wanting to see that, there is no such thing as a coherent sentence. Since the tape's running out and some of you people's brainwaves are running out, am I going to have to leave it there and say, trust me? 
I don't mean trust me and forget about it. I mean trust me that there is something there, even if you're drawing a blank. Look at the way in which you ordinarily think. Look at the way that people talk. Everybody, presidents, priests, rabbis, people talk in such a way. They use verbs now. I know all that. And apparently people make coherent sentences or you couldn't ask somebody how to get to such and such address. They've got to use verbs. They say, well, go so-and-so and all that. But look at what I'm saying, that ordinary intelligence, part of it is a kind of built-in laziness or to be a little more correct. I'm sure Brother Newton would be proud of me. It is a kind of conservation of energy <laughs> to try and see everything as nouns because as long as it's good, you don't have to do anything. As long as it's iron ore and there it is, you know, what do you want from me? You're just walking by. And some voice in the heaven says, do you realize that's iron ore? And maybe you look around and say, well, if you say so. And it says, well. You say, well, I agreed. <laughs> And if it says, don't you want to pick it up and uh, work on it for years and make an internal combustion engine out of it? And if you say, uh, no. <laughs> if you say, well, I'm not qualified. Or if you say, well, I'm in a hurry. See, that you're wired up that you don't want to see. That there's any other possibility. You do not want to see these goods as possible being services. You don't want to see this noun as being potentially a verb. You don't want to see that there would be more exploitable energy if you would move that sucker. Because to see any of that requires then, we'd assume, that you're going to have to participate. Oh, all right. But as long as you're wired up to it, well, I see iron ore, if that's what you call it, I see that. Yeah, but you see the potential of it if you worked on it. And you think, if I say no, will he leave me alone? <laughs> Do you realize the potential that may be laying in that little chunk of innocent looking material? And you go, no, I don't. Maybe I'm dumb. You know, if I do that, is he going to say, well, go ahead and I'll get somebody else? That is sort of what I'm suggesting to you in a kind of psychological apparent lemming of all this is the way it seems to operate because it's an attempt at conservation of energy on your part. Mm. This life itself still working, trying to strike the most balanced line of efficiency within its own being. But on that basis is another way to look at what I started to conclude this with, that nothing seems to make a complete statement. The ordinary old intelligence always believes, well, a priest, a book, somebody, even my own thought, almost explain everything or at least this one area it almost it was so good I wrote it down I underlined it but I go back and look and there's always something missing <laughs> even at times I'm not even sure what is missing that's not it it's just I simply feel that something is missing <laughs> that this statement is not all inclusive <clears throat> welcome to the city <laughs> life does not on the basis of that which will appeal to and is audible and understandable to old intelligence. Life does not make complete, coherent sentences. You cannot do it only using nouns with a few temporary verbs. I will do my rhetorical exhortation. It's not a disclaimer. You do understand that I am not simply talking about nouns, iron ore, goods. It's the way the electrochemical activity of this highest end of the nervous system operates. Well, it is that basis that makes everything not only appear to be too complex when it is more simplistic, it also makes things in other areas appear to be more simplistic when they're not that direct. But it gets down that still if any of you find this too complex or too distracting. What I'm describing of the nervous system wanting, wired up, wanting to see things on the basis of them being stable, solid nouns as opposed to verbs, being stuff as opposed to services, is look at what most intelligence believes to be beyond any theoretical unanswerable questions, 
the real heavy shit in life. That is death, the matters of life and death. What does the ordinary intellect see them as? Not verbs. Nouns. Now, I don't care that you can look in the dictionary. I'm sure under death, one way or the other, it's got a verb. There's some, of course, I know there's a variation, a verbal variation of the word. But people do not think of life or death as services, as verbs. They're nouns. They're stuff. Death is something that, you know, like a piece of iron, or you stumble over it, and that's it. <laughs> Nine minutes. What can you do in nine minutes? Well, I got some. I still got the questions. Here we go. Are you ready? As many as I've still got left from you people. Are you ready? Here we go. Here we go. In acknowledging that one must earn money to pay for one's goods and services in the city, a question rolls in my mind about occupations that do not seem to be particularly suitable for someone involved with this. It seemed to me, for instance, that it would be inappropriate for somebody attempting to do this to be a hitman, a weapons designer. <laughs> well, I got nine minutes, don't laugh. Hurry up. <laughs> and they mentioned a few more, but then, but then the person points out, they said, but one that really strikes me, for reasons that I'm not aware of, or you know, the reason why they're asking, is all of those occupations that would seem to be easily categorized as money changers. Why does it seem that profiting from buying and selling of loans and business, etc., why does that seem to strike the person, the person wrote the, that struck them as being inappropriate? You do realize, all of you are well read enough, that this is not a one-person observation. Throughout recorded history, money changers of all sorts have been bad-mouthed all over the world. And the question is, the person asking it, was it just local with them, and if not, why? May I suggest to you this? I've talked about this before, and none of you really want to face up to it like I'd like for you to. It's the odor of dealing with debt. Now forget all the other shit that you might come up with that you picked up somewhere else of life churning up everybody's account and people thinking this and that about the ill-advised or the ill-appropriate ways of trying to make money off somebody else's bad luck that they got to come to you for a loan. All that's true enough in the city. If that didn't tell you anything, I'm telling you that there is physically at work an odor. But just the way that I've told you that there is a physical difficulty. There is a slight virus in being in debt. It's one way that life makes you see death approaching. It's one way that life has you tied to ordinary time because the monthly payments. You dread going to the mailbox and pulling out. Sometime it's about this week. There it is, the return address. Master charge. God, I don't want to see that. There's an odor to it. And it comes out in other ways. It comes out. There's an even, if any of you can hear this right quick, there's even a further description I can give, but it starts getting around the corner of the 3D world. And that's... It's the inappropriateness in the city of people trafficking in the non-existent <laughs> money, which is the basis of it. I know it comes out saying like debt, but it's money when there is no such thing, or debt, which there is no such thing. Oh, there is if you agree to it. If you agree, there are all sorts of people ready to dance. But that is one reason that it seems so open to people who are bad-mouthed. But don't feel that bad-mouthed are people in debt. I'm the only person not in debt that you ever heard, will ever hear say anything along the lines about don't go in debt. Because in the city, the only people that bad mouth debt are those in debt. And I don't know anybody in the city that's not in debt. When is it correct for a revolutionist to have a child if there is a present time? It's this question again, which I don't mind answering. This came from out of town, and since somebody fell in you, there is more or less a correct time as far as life's concerned, running by its speed. And I've had this question before. This happens to be from a man this time. It's 
in the times past I brought this up, it's been a woman asked that some of the people in the group have said that they really had passing serious feelings that they should have a child and they're getting old enough that they feel like they should do it now or forget about it. Remember, just because there is a biological, which is real enough, I have nothing whatsoever ill to say about so-called biological urges. Nothing. If that's what you're waiting for. But just because there's a biological urge, and just because life may tell you at the biological level that yes, now is the time for you to have a child. What it's saying is now is the time for your type to have a child. Now is the person, like I wired you up to be, to have a child. But that does not necessarily mean that you must do what your own molecular urges to procreate tell you to. I'm not telling you to or not to. In a sense, it's irrelevant. In a sense to doing this. A real revolutionist, look at this way again, has got to be able to ask him or herself at a higher molecular level than down of just the procreation, which is real enough and necessary enough, but you've got to be able to ask yourself at another higher level, is what I'm contemplating. If I do it, what is the possible benefit, the profit, to me, not to life, not to the race of humanity, but to me. And of course, if you can't get past that level, you can't really answer the question. All you can do is say, well, I feel like I want to have a kid, and if I go much further, I know the statistics show that there's danger, an increasing danger of birth defects because of my age, and I feel like it's now or never. All right, you can listen to that. And don't wait for me to come around and say, my, my, you shouldn't have listened to that. If you've got to listen to that, you can listen to that. But I'm telling you, it is not necessary that each and every person have a child. I can say that, at least to some degree, each and every person at one time at least thinks, boy, I'd like to be a little father or a little mother. <laughs> you can or you may not. But there are the urges. There are, I'm just shorthanging it since we're running out of tape calling it biological urges. You know that is part of of the kit and kettle of being human, of any race, not only you, hell, possums, minks, hippos, <laughs> to have little hippos. But the revolutionist, if you can get above that level, which you've got no claim to being revolution, if you, if you can't, and I'm not suggesting what your answer will be, but you've got to be able to get above that letter and say, all right, that level, and say, to me personally, knowing what I know about me, about how I behave, how I think, how I speak, of what benefit, what, and is it going to profit me, me, in any way that I can separate me from life, which is what's telling me and everybody else to go have kids, how's it going to profit me individually as opposed to life or as opposed to keeping the race going, which obviously looking around, you know, if I don't have a kid, I don't think the whole thing's going to collapse. <laughs> you got to be able to ask that kind of question. One and a half minutes. Can I answer three questions in one and a half minutes? Why not? No, I can't. Let me end, let me end with one since we're running out. This is not a question. Just somebody wrote me when I was taking a question. I'm just going to read it. I sometimes used to wonder, where was the hat? Then I would wonder, okay, now where's the rabbit? Then I wondered how there was a rabbit but no hat. And now sometimes I wonder how there is a rabbit when there really wasn't one to start with. And now I wonder, how is there a hat without a rabbit? But more so, I'm just beginning to wonder what's going to be pulled out on us next. <laughs> <laughs> I will bow to my betters when I meet them and make no comment, and we'll end up on that. I'm going ahead and hit these other two before I carry them and sweat them to death. It appears that all talent, the person says to them at times, it appears sometimes to me that all talent comes about naturally with no apparent effort on the part of the gifted one. It's what we are trying to do, an exception to this. All right, the first part of that is really kind of indicative of the ability to cultivate new intelligence. Anybody could even ask the question that is, or make the observation that it seems as though real talent is not cultivated. Now that's disturbing to the city. 
to say the least, because in the city they end up, in general, the institutions of the city per se, really have to deny that. That is, that part of life's body has to deny that, or people wouldn't try to do anything, right? Where would all these nice, at least back in the 30s and 40s, all these nice, pleasingly plump, middle-aged spinsters with their hair in a bun, how would they make a living were it not for all kinds of little nippers like some of you and me taking piano lessons when, at least looking back, you've got to give the woman credit. She was not knowing it, perhaps, an example of what should have been a stoic to be able to stand there and smile <laughs> and to take your mother's two dollars and to listen to you play and go, my, my, aren't we doing better? When she realized you didn't have the musical talent of her dog. <laughs> At any rate, in the city, even that can't be seen. It just can't be seen. It can't be tolerated. But, do you understand what I'm suggesting? Of course, all of you should know this about yourself. What is really called talent? The person, let me just blame it back on the person that wrote it to me. It appears to them, sometimes, that it just comes about naturally with no apparent effort on the part of the gifted one, the person with the talent. I just read them, folks. <laughs> the last part, as I was calling the sentence, is what we are trying to do with this, an exception to that. I really like that. I like that part, the last part so much, I'm not going to make any comment. <laughs> Well, let me read this other one. In the kind of work I do, people will tell me that they have built a building. He does some kind of, well, it comes out. I do a construction. And people will tell me that they have built a building exactly like the plans call for. And then I go to the job site and I work and they did not. <laughs> people all... People always say that they did it according to the plans, and they never do. <laughs> I'm still reading now. This is not a criticism on my part of how things get done, but it just strikes me that there is something very strange going on. And it gets worse, because everybody seems to know that things are wrong. <laughs> that things are organized this way, and they often complain about it indirectly to me. But at the same time, it's almost like people know this as the way things are, and almost simultaneously, they do not know. Everybody hear that? I could just leave it because it is a fair observation, the kinds of things that I've pointed around and sketched out and outlined. But I was going to take this one a little further if you followed all that, uh, at least the part that was sort of the tail end the person points out that in a sense, even though he said that they'll insist that we did it just right, that he'll go look, and they didn't. And he says they, in fact, he suspects, knows it most of the time. And yet they stand there and can't help it, and they'll say they did. And he'll know that they did, even before he got there. And that they know that they didn't, and they'll say, yes, I did. Exactly. <laughs> all right, that, that part, and him saying it's strange, all right, this strangeness that he was saying, about this. Could be, I'm just going, this is stretching a little bit, but maybe some of you will hear it. That kind of situation, if it goes on far enough and gets complex enough, it can be on the verge of a change actually taking place, wherein it appears that much or many people involved with the situation will say one thing and then apparently do something else, but then there begins to be the sensation, at least among some of them, that, hey, this is some kind of facade, or they don't know what they call it. You know, we keep saying one thing and doing something else and insisting we don't. Once that kind of awareness starts, you're normally talking about the verge of a kind of shelf, or the slinky moving down another step, moving over another way, of things perhaps changing. Of course, when that happens, then the situation becomes unstrange. <laughs> Well, I was just going to point out that this, from a certain kind of observation, if you could have, if you followed what I was saying, that is one way that you can see an observable way. Observable sometimes just in verbiage, but is 
a way in which life sometimes actually moves. That is, of just ordinary people beginning to say, do you realize? And then they begin to point out what seems to be almost irony. Because they would be critical, wherein this person was trying to point out that he wasn't just making a critical observation that, hell, all these people come in and say, yeah, we did just like the plans, and they didn't. But now in ordinary life, of course, it starts off as a kind of criticism. And you'd have somebody in some position of hollering, oh, you fuckers that come in here, you keep saying that and you don't. One guy says that. And then a the whole department says it. And then some of the people, they're staying around the other contractors. They're on the other side of the counter. One guy come in and say, I did just like the plans. You'll say, I've been through this with you before. I remember you. I know you didn't. And some of the contractors will begin to go, kind of laugh like, and they're agreeing that, yeah, that's the way it goes because we know it's not true. <laughs> Even us. All right, that's the kind of thing that you can begin to see at times that life is perhaps making its own move. And it does come out through humans that they'll talk about it. They'll satirize it. They'll call it ironical. They'll call it, or they'll be critical of it. Oftentimes, but then it can almost turn into a kind of laissez-faire statement of the irony of, yeah, I know people, sometimes maybe even me. We kind of say we'll do one thing, we do something else. <laughs> I had no flamboyant conclusion to that, but I just wanted, since he pointed it out, I'd never had occasion to make that specific observation, but you can see when things seem to be at wide variance in some situation, over a wide range is the wide variance of what people are saying and then what they're doing, up to the point that even those involved cannot remain completely blind to it. You may be seeing life again to make a change, but it does seem strange. But as soon as it begins to change, it's unstrange. And it can almost be in a little isolated example of you looking at one situation, it can almost seem to happen overnight. Which those of you that keep up with quantum physics, it's like the moving, separated particles that you can apparently extract information from one of them and instantly, as they say, beyond, in disregard of the speed of light, being oblivious to all known laws of physics, and even suspicions, a particle, like its evil twin brother, somewhere else instantly gives the same report. The one over here says, all right, you got me, I admit I'm so-and-so. And over here, the one says, me too. <laughs> Does that sound? It's as though one Friday you close up, and the next Monday you come back and stand behind your counter, and by and large, it's like all these contractors have changed. Not just, of course, the contractors, but apparently their behavior of this old scenario that you saw that they continually come in and say, yep, no, yeah. You say, have you lived up by this and that? Yep, yep, yep. Everything you ask, yep. Absolutely right down the line, and it's not so. From one Friday to next Monday, apparently it can change. It wasn't, of course, the people. It was life was moving. And if you could sit in a certain way, you had lots of warning. Not that life doing it is a warning necessarily, but an astute would-be revolutionist can continually do what other people imagine, that is, tell the future. Uh, don't take that too weird. You can tell the future, that is, hey, my forecast is that things are going to change. Probably $20, please. 